Hi guys. So today I want to introduce the, your second programming assignment, which is on reliable data transmission. Um, with that, you are getting some starter code. So let me explain how all this is going to work. So uh, first of all, the code is available in, or the assignment is available in our uh, programming assignments repository under the RDT branch. So um, then the assignment is here in the readme. Okay, um, so basically your job is to implement the reliable data transfer protocol, um, which we have been discussing in class in recent days. And so as far as learning objectives, you will work with a layered network architecture, um, and then you'll implement stop and wait protocols with acknowledgements, negative acknowledgements and retransmissions. All right, so this is sort of protocol building based on the protocols that we discussed in class. Okay, and so your job will basically be to implement two protocols. One is the RDT 2.1, the other one is RDT 3.0, discussed in lectures, slides, and in the book as well. So kind of this name matches. You can follow the kind of protocol design that is outlined in the book in case you get lost. You don't have to kind of design it from scratch. There's solutions sort of provided to you there already, at least conceptually. You have state transition diagrams in the book. Um, you, should be, you should be good to go, at least on the conceptual design stuff. So what I'm giving you guys is a starting code that works um, in a bunch of layers. So you're getting something at the application layer, which talks to something at the transport layer, which talks to something at the network layer. So at the application layer, we have the client and the server, which talk to each other. And they basically exchange the messages where the client will send some quote to the server and the server will return that quote in pig Latin. You can kind of look up what that is if this is a new idea to you. Um, so it's basically a text transformation and then a reply goes back to the server. For the client to send the message, uh, it calls um, RDT 1.0 send. This is kind of the starting code. You'll be implementing 2.1 and 3.0. Um, and that invokes the rdt.py implementation of the transport layer, which then calls UDT send to invoke the transmission over the network layer. Um, network layers kind of talk to each other, um, transmit the data over, and then um, the server can call rdt 1.0 receive, which will call uh, UDT receive at the rdt, uh, getting the data from the network. All right, so that's how you get a flow in that direction, and then the reply goes in the other direction. All right, um, so the server converts the text to Pig Latin, talked about it, talked about how the functions get called. Okay, and so what you'll be doing is extending the implementation of rdt.py to implement uh, tolerance of packet corruption and loss. Mm. Um, the network that I'm giving you is reliable at the moment. So UDT send and UDT receive are reliable, but you can change parameters in the network layer to start getting packet loss and uh, corruption. All right, so for testing, you'll want to turn these on to make sure that your protocols still work correctly. Okay, to call the programs, you call the server.py and client.py specifying the local host, which is where the server is running, though you can do it over a network as well. Um, and yeah, that's it as far as the setup. Um, let me go over the code before I get into kind of um, bonus and, and grading. So here we have the repository on the right. We can start by looking at what the client does. So the client will basically parse the arguments and start. Um, it has a, a buffer of quotes it wants to convert to Pig Latin. All right, and it's basically going to iterate through this uh, message list and send messages to the server using RDT 1.0 send. Okay. Um, and then uh, for, each message in, um, for each message in this list, and then it's going to uh, try to get the response that you receive, and then it's going to print out um, what the server converted the message to, and then it's going to iterate by sending another one of these messages, 
and then getting another response and then printing that out again. Okay, so pretty simple. Here is just a basic timeout mechanism to make sure the server, keep, uh, the client keeps going, sending stuff. All right, so very simple. Now we have the server, which does the processing. You have two functions here, which one convert a word to Pig Latin, two convert a message to Pig Latin. Um, you don't need to mess with these, they work um, or work well enough, I suppose, even if there's bugs, don't worry about it. Um, but here's what the server does. So it uh, receives a message, calls RDT 1.0 receive, okay? And then it is going to uh, get that message, send it to Pig Latin, get a response message, and then send the message back to the client using RDT 1.0 send, right? Now you'll notice that both the client and the server rely on the RDT layer, okay? So they initialize the transport layer um, with either um, to get the RDT object which then, on which they can then call the send and receive functions, right? You'll notice that the RDT has to start as either a server or a client. This is just a, a, a function of this implementation. Um, basically what it requires is that the server start first. Um, so that the client can connect to it. Um, I should say that this kind of layered architecture that we're, that we're doing here is um, sort of a very, very basic implementation of a network simulator. Um, in this one, we have the network layers kind of connected together directly. Um, right? There's really not much of a network, um, but in following assignments will have more of a network where there's actually multiple hubs between the client and server. Okay, so both the client and server rely on RDT. So let's see what happens in the transport layer in rdt.py, okay? Um, we have basically two functions here. We have a packet, which is a thing being sent around in the network, and then we have the class rdt, all right? So let's talk about the packet first. So the packet contains a sequence number, okay, just so we know which packet this is. Uh, we know how long the packet is, and we have a checksum of the packet. All right, so this is basically your, your packet format, just three fields, okay? Um, we can initialize a packet um, with a sequence number and a particular message, all right? And then we have two, two functions that converted into a string. So first function is, I guess the second function, but I'll talk about it first, is get byte string. Okay, so we'll take um, the packet object, or basically this class object, and then we will um, convert the sequence number to bytes, okay, according to sequence number length, right? So basically we're forcing sequence number, okay, whatever it might be, to have the length of 10 characters. All right. Then we're going to have um, our length string, okay, which will take length and it will also convert it, um, uh, it will compute the length based on um, how long this packet is, based on basically the sequence number length, uh, the length of the length field and the length of the data um, and then encode it in 10 characters as well. Okay, then we add a checksum to this, okay, and then the string that comprises the packet or its set of bytes is the length string plus um, the sequence number plus the checksum plus the message, okay? The key thing is that the lengths of these fields, okay, are controlled by these values. And so when we're forming this packet, um, we're using always exactly the same number of uh, characters for each of those fields. That makes the packet format. All right. Now, when we want to decode the packet from string, basically deserialize it, we can uh, take a byte string, okay, and then compute the sequence number by basically parsing this byte string according to these lengths, okay? So we can extract sequence number, we can extract the message, um, we can check if the packet is, uh, has been corrupted, okay? 
uh, based on this function and then we can return a new object which is has the sequence number and message which are the class variables um, object variables of this of this class all right so the corrupt thing basically checks if the packet is corrupt based on the field lengths um, and values it recomputes the checksum um, you guys don't need to touch this actually you guys don't need to touch anything in this in this packet uh, class just so you know how this works okay um, but basically the corrupt class uh, the corrupt function corresponds to the corrupt function that we've been discussing in class to check a to verify that the packet is correct all right so then we get to the implementation of rdt which sends around packets so we will initialize rdt by starting a network layer all right and the network layer also takes a role basically takes the role that was passed on to uh, the initialization of rdt okay um, and then a uh, server and port which are the things that are initialized when you start the program i'll get into why that matters in a second all right but anyway we're we're passing some initialization parameters into the network layer and now we have a network layer interface all right um, there's a disconnect function just to kind of close this program and now we have the two functions that we start to care about we have rdt send and rdt receive rdt send is pretty simple you take the message whatever the message is um, that someone wants to send you create a packet from it okay you can increment the sequence number um, right so the next packet gets called with a greater sequence number and then you're taking that packet you're passing it to udt send by first converting it to bytes this is using this function okay so basically udt send just accepts a string of bytes udt receive calls udt sorry rdt receive calls udt receive on the network layer okay which gives us some byte string we can add this to the buffer right and now we can see how many bytes we have received if we received first we need to check if we received um, enough bytes to decode the length of the packet right if we don't if we haven't received the 10 bytes we need to decode the length we don't know how long the packet is right in that case we're going to uh, basically skip this and and iterate um, um, again right um, so we're going to return um, string s okay um, and actually we'll see how you're basically getting a partial um, partial return at this point right actually sorry no at this point let me back up I'll explain this in detail. okay so we start with the return string of none all right so when we call udt receive we get some set of bytes if there are not enough bytes to decode the length we're going to return just basically none all right what else can happen well if we know how many bytes there are now we can try to get we can see if we can get the whole packet okay so we can extract the length of the packet and now we can see if um, we have enough bytes to uh, decode the packet okay if not we're going to return again none right but if we do have enough bytes to decode the um, to decode the buffer uh, to, to decode a packet we're going to then try forming a packet okay from from the the buffer and then we're going to add the message from that packet into return string okay. now we can see if there's actually more data that we have received so every time we call udt receive we get some amount of bytes those bytes go into byte buffer and then we see if we can extract a packet from byte buffer if there are more bytes than for one packet we're going to try to loop here to extract another packet right if we can extract no packet from here we're going to return return s which is none if we can extract one packet from here we're going to create red s which includes that message okay um, and then we'll try to extract another packet possibly adding it to return string possibly not okay so if there's two packets in the buffer we can extract both of them and there's one and a half we just extract one if there's just a half packet we extract none 
Right? You can kind of walk through this code again and, and see exactly what happens. Uh, this covers some very rare cases. Mostly we just get exactly one packet and we can just return it. All right, so that's UDT receive. Now, what your job is going to be is to implement RDT 2.1 send and RDT 2.1 receive. Now, the beauty of it is that you don't actually have to rewrite these functions. In, in some cases, you may be able to get away just calling them to get, um, to get the data, or you can copy the code over, uh, possibly change it around a bit, um, possibly add some more fields to uh, the packet class to get, to get these things to work. Okay, if you do end up changing the packet class, um, you also need to change these functions to encode the new fields. And this one too. All right. Um, so that's it. Oh, no, let me show you the network. Okay, so the network class basically connects RDT things. So each RDT object, let me go back to that. Each RDT object will initialize by creating a network class, a network layer, like I talked about it. Okay. So what the network layer does is actually forwards data to another network layer. All right. So we'll do some initialization. Um, and in the initialization, you'll see that the network layer either starts in the client role or in the server role. Um, this is basically just so we can establish a, a socket. So we first start the server, which starts the network layer in the server role, which opens up a TCP socket. Okay, then, then the other network layer in the client role can connect to using also a TCP socket. All right? So the TCP socket here is used just to connect two things. You can, it's just a way to pass data. I'm using TCP just because it's easy, but normally the network layer would be using um, it, you know, would be using the link layer, then it would be using the physical layer. I'm kind of shortcutting that by providing a communication channel via a socket. That's why we need to start one thing as a server, one thing as a client. Um, I could have implemented it differently using UDP, um, but this, the, the TCP socket allows me to control what happens on this link a little bit more explicitly. Okay, so. The way we control what happens on this link is by controlling probability of packet loss, probability of byte corruption, probability of packet reorder. Right now, these are all zero, and so the network layer provides a completely reliable channel. But what, what you could do for testing or to implement versions of the protocol that tolerate packet loss or packet corruption is you can change these to non-zero numbers. I would still kind of have them low-ish, so you don't have errors all the time, but high enough that you can actually observe the errors occurring and your protocol recovering from those. All right, so when we go to UDT send, okay, ultimately, um, here's, okay, so let's go, th let's go through this. So when you try to call UDT send, um, it will see if the packet loss value, the probability of packet loss, is greater than some random number, okay? Um, this will be a number between zero and one. This should be a number between zero and one. And so if that's the case, if, if you kind of randomly decide to, if, if this random number is um, uh, low enough, that packet that you're trying to send over UDT send will be lost by simply UDT send doing nothing and returning, okay? If the packet is getting corrupted based on what you said in probability of byte corruption, we're going to uh, corrupt the packet okay, by changing some bytes in it. Um, what we're going to do though is basically protect the, uh, protect the length field. Okay? So this becomes really, your life becomes really difficult if you can get corruption in the packet length field. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that it doesn't happen in the network. It's a bit of a shortcut. Um, I guess I need to update this to 10. Okay, so I'll do that. Um, all right, the other thing. Okay, so then you have probability of packet reorder. Um, I don't need to go over that. It's just going to get, re it's going to reorder to packet, putting kind of one in temporary memory. Um, all right, and then 
Um, once we kind of go through this and we know what message we're sending, we, can, we could have done different things to the message under corruption or reordering. Um, but either way, we're sending a message here. Um, and it's basically going to use the TCP socket to send the data um, to the other socket. So, so from client to server, from the server to client, you know, basically over a single link. All right. And then when we start the server, or sorry, when we start a network layer, we start a thread called collector, which will just basically um, call, keep calling the collect function. All right. And what the collect function does is it receives data from the network and stores it in the internal buffer. Okay. So we're basically continually try to receive data on this connection, uh, on this uh, TCP connection socket and put it into receive bytes. All right. So that's what it does. And then when um, you call, um, okay, so we're adding it to, to buffer S and then when you call UDT receive, you're going to basically get whatever's in this buffer S returned to you and then return and then clear the buffer. All right, so those are the two functions. Um, you have UDT send, okay, which transmits data and UDT receive. When you're first trying to work these functions, you can leave these, write your own functions, you can leave this at zero, but then you can add, let's say, packet corruption or packet loss by changing this to non-zero numbers for packet loss or byte corruption to randomly happen. Um, again, your implementation will go into RDT receive, sorry, into the RDT class uh, by implementing RDT 2.1 functions and RDT 3.0 functions. All right, so with that, what do you guys need to submit? So um, we'll have a bonus. Uh, we'll have one bonus point for anybody that implements RDT 3.1, which can deal with packet reorder. To initiate that, you need to uh, set this to be non-zero. Okay, and then you can also implement RDT 4.0, which is a pipeline implementation. We haven't talked about pipelining yet. Um, I believe we're going to talk about it on Friday. All right, so what are you going to submit? You're going to submit um, a whole bunch of files and, of course, YouTube videos showing the implementation, um, the execution of your program. So we have the partner TXT as before. We have contributors TXT as before. Um, and then we have two kind of separate submissions. Um, one for RDT 2.1 and one for RDT 3.0. Okay, here's kind of what these things are supposed to do. Um, and then for RDT 3.0, here's the things that RDT 3.0 is supposed to do. Each of these is going to be, have rely on separate code. Um, you could implement everything in kind of one set of functions, but um, Sometimes things can get screwed up between assignments or between 2.1 and 3.0. So what I would encourage you guys is to implement 2.1. Okay, log those files, save them, rename them, submit them separately, get them ready for submission separately, and then start playing with this. Because what could happen is that you implement 2.1 just fine, it works, and then you end up breaking it when you start implementing this. So just to be extra safe, let's um, do these assignments um, using separate code bases. And for each one, I'm going to ask you to record a five minute video. Um, and then if you guys are doing bonuses, then a uh, separate set of files, separate video, etc. All right. I think that about covers it. Um, I know you guys have struggled with the last program assignment. This one is a little bit easier in a sense that you don't have to bring in a whole bunch of um, packages that you haven't worked with before, getting it to work using, um, you know, just kind of production level packages. Um, but so this assignment is easier in that you kind of have all the code you need to work with right here. It is a bit harder because getting these mechanisms to work um, is somewhat tricky, all right? Getting even these mechanisms to work is somewhat tricky. 
So definitely make time for it. Definitely come to office hours and ask me questions. Definitely talk to the TA. Um, this is a difficult assignment, but it's uh, pretty rewarding and we'll be kind of working with this network simulator in future assignments as well. Each time you'll have a fresh starting code, but um, I would say uh, get to know this layout and how these functions, how, these, how this code works because we'll be reusing it again. So if you put in time now in office hours, um, in kind of uh, technical help discussions, in um, just kind of asking questions through the discussion forums, this will pay off making your job a little bit easier down the road. All right, thank you guys.